Hi there, my name is Brian Pelfrey. I'm Judd Woldridge. I'm Mike Tuttle. And I'm R.W. Moody. And we were placed right here in this community uh, to love and to serve right here where God has placed us. And it is not about us. It is about the King and His Kingdom. And we want to share with you what is happening this Christmas season. Yeah, so December 4th is a big day here in Miamisburg. Uh, it's the kickoff really to the Christmas season. There's going to be the annual Christmas parade that will kick off at four o'clock and other events will happen that will culminate in the lighting of the Christmas tree at 630 right downtown in Riverfront Park. Yep. So we want to join together and right as the tree lights, we'd like to be there together to sing and worship the King, knowing that Christmas is about Christ. And it's so easy to be distracted by so many things. And we want to slow down, take a minute, not long, but take a little bit of time to keep our focus on Jesus. Yeah. And so we think it's important for us as Christ followers in this community to get together and celebrate the light, celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ. So why don't you join us on December 4th? Yeah, it's going to be great. Welcome to Miami Valley Church. My name is Pastor Jed, and I'm so thankful that you've invited us into the church that's meeting in your home. I hope you had a wonderful Thanksgiving in your home with your family, giving praise to God for who he is and all that he has done. Today, we kick off Advent. It's the Advent season where we celebrate by remembering uh, the coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to this earth. We believe that he came to this earth. He died a death on a cross for our sins. He was placed in a tomb, and three days later, he rose, and we believe that he is coming back. And so this season, we celebrate his first coming, but we also prepare our hearts for his second coming. And so we want to make Jesus the focus, King Jesus. That's where we want to set our gaze through this season. We can get distracted by so many other things that fight for our attention, but we want to be intentional about making Jesus the focus. And so over the next four weeks, we're gonna be looking at how we can worship him fully, how we can spend less, how we can give more, and how we can love all. And so we wanna equip you and your family and your home with resources, with starter points on how to do those things how you and your home and your family can be more intentional. Would you go to our website, miamivalley.org, under the family tab, you will see Advent. All throughout that is resources where, where we give you uh, starter points, uh, just ways to be more intentional in your home. And so today, as we focus on worship, how can we worship Him fully? Would you be more intentional this week in worshiping King Jesus for who he is? Uh, all throughout scripture, we see that, that worship can look different. Uh, it's not just songs, uh, but it shows us uh, where David, it says, David danced before the Lord. We see where Jacob leaned against his staff and worshiped God. Uh, worship can be giving God uh, all of this. Everything that I have is yours. Uh, Lord, I give this to you in worship. Worship can be uh, so many, so many ways. Uh, maybe it's walking in nature and just proclaiming, telling him how wonderful his creation is, how beautiful he is and the way that he created. And so would you, uh, would your home, would your family uh, just go through this week thinking about how you can be more intentional about worshiping our King, King Jesus. Let us worship together right now. Hey, these are my friends, Jack and Abby, and they lead worship here at the House of Prayer in Dayton, Ohio, right here where God has placed us. And as we've been talking about unity, friends, this is the picture of the body, the family that God has brought together to worship right here on earth as it is in heaven. And so would you join us as they lead us today? Would you join us in worshiping King Jesus?
And welcome to the first Sunday of Advent. I, I don't know if you've heard or not, but there is a global supply chain issue going on. Uh, global supply chain, that, that's a weird thing to talk about, right, on the, on the first Sunday of Advent. But, you know, just in a gross generalization, uh, the global supply chain, it's that, it's that invisible pathway, right? It's that invisible pathway where we, where we take things that have been manufactured, mined, or grown, and they follow that invisible pathway to get to the, to the end user, they, they, to get to the people that want to, to take them, consume to the people that need them or want them. Sometimes it's one or the other. But that's the global supply chain, and, and so we're, we're experiencing that problem. And on this first Sunday of Advent, I, I would submit to you that we need to be thinking about the fact that is there a spiritual supply chain issue going on across the globe? I think Jesus addressed that in the scriptures. And as we think about Advent, it's, Advent is this four-week season. It's the four Sundays, the four weeks before Christmas, when, we, when we're supposed to be intentional and think about the first appearing. Advent means to appear, about the first appearing when Jesus, when Jesus came. But, but one of the problems we have as Americans especially, but I think the church worldwide, is, is we really don't know how to, to wait. Uh, we, we get impatient, and we, we see that, especially in America, with what I like to call the Christmas creep. The Christmas creep is that Christmas starts showing up sometime before the Halloween candy comes out, that Christmas starts doing this, and music is played, and I don't want to get into the issue about when should music be played, and, you know, good grief, how many how many months now do we have to watch Hallmark Christmas music, uh, movies, and nothing but Hallmark Christmas music? There's just this Christmas creep, and we look at Advent as a, as a season of his appearing, and a season of preparation, what do I need to do to prepare to get ready for the day, what do I need to do to get ready to prepare for the day but but it came to me this year that advent isn't a journey we make advent is about the journey that jesus made the first time the first advent when he came uh, born of a virgin advent is going to happen again a second advent a second appearing when he doesn't come back as a baby but he comes back as king of kings and lord of lord Advent is about the journey that God makes. It isn't about a trip that we prepare to go on, which is what we want to do. Hey, how do I get ready for Christmas Day and all those kind of things so that I'm really ready to celebrate Jesus? And, and we just want to think about this in a little bit different way. This, this year, I want us to think about Advent underneath the theme. And Pastor Woldridge introduced this to you a little bit last week about perhaps today. We need to live with the readiness that the second Advent could come uh, maybe even today. And if we're, we're there, what do we need to do to prepare the way for Jesus to come back again? Advent's a time when we ready ourselves to receive this God who's going to appear against us, this God who against all odds, this God who against all reason and for uh, unknown things except to him was willing to appear to us a first time and uh, come in the form of Jesus and live a life of perfection and to die a death on a cross and to rise from the dead so that we can have life. And he's coming again to receive those who believe in him uh, to be with him forever. It's about this journey that God is making towards us. And so as we think about Advent this year, as we think about perhaps today, as we think about this, this supply, the spiritual supply chain issue that's, that's going on globally, I want us to look at Luke chapter 3. Luke chapter 3, about Jesus coming the first time, which will help us think about Jesus coming the second time. Luke chapter 3, because this way in verse 1, in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, Herod, tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip, tetrarch of Iturea and Trachontus, and Licinius, tetrarch of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. He went out into all the country around Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, as is written in the book of Isaiah the prophet. This is about John the Baptist. Listen to these words. This is what we're going to zero in on today. How, how do I prepare for the second advent? The first advent and learning to wait for, for Christmas and not allow Christmas creep to creep in uh, uh, lets me prepare for the second advent. Listen to this. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make strip make straight paths for him every valley shall be filled in every mountain made and hill made low the crooked road shall become straight the rough ways made smooth and all people all people will see god's salvation in the world of this time if you found out that a at a ruler a king one of these ones that was mentioned tiberius caesar pontius pilate of herod was if somebody was coming to your region one of the responsibilities of those uh were to prepare the way to make sure that that the the pathway was smooth the pathway was was ready for this for this king for this ruler to get there just as easily as possible on his behalf 
And so it's, it's a voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight paths for him. And I'm, I'm just afraid with this spiritual gl global supply chain issue that's going on, most of us aren't working on uh, the understanding that perhaps today Jesus could come back, so we're really not preparing the way for him. We're really not uh, being intentional about how we should live our lives. And so I just want to talk to you today about this kind of preparation. It's not preparing for a moment. It's not preparing for, for Christmas Day. It's about preparing the way for the Lord because the call of John the Baptist's life, I believe, is similar to the call that rests on us who aren't waiting anymore for the first advent, but we're waiting for the second advent. So let's just go for this. I want you to see that this is a, I want you to see the picture of preparation, the picture of preparation, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, a voice of one calling in the wilderness. Let me ask you this question. What's your voice saying right now about Jesus' second advent? We've been praying for over a year, almost two years as a community of faith. God, how would you have us uh, love and share Jesus with this valley that it needs to begin in our hearts, that it needs to go to our homes, that it needs to go to our neighborhoods? What is your voice saying about Jesus in your home? What is your, how is your voice preparing the way? How is your voice preparing the way in your neighborhood? How is your voice preparing the way in this valley? How is your voice preparing the way uh, to the ends of the earth? God, how would you have us love and share Jesus with this valley? Let me ask you a few questions. Is your life a life that shares and shows the way of Jesus? Uh, back in Acts chapter 16, uh, the disciples uh, were walking and, and there came a girl who was um, just adamant about and screaming at the top of her lungs. And it, she said, she followed Paul and the rest of us shouting, these men are servants of the most high God who are telling you the way to be saved, Acts 16, 17. These men are the servants of the most high God telling you the way to be saved. That was their voice crying out in the wilderness. This is the way to be saved. Jesus is the way, the truth and life, proclaiming Jesus. What's your voice saying right now as you prepare the way for Jesus' second advent? Let me just ask you a few questions. Is your voice a voice of praise? Have you come to the conclusion about what God's been teaching us as a community of faith? And we're seeing this every Tuesday night and every time we're together, there's nothing more important that we have to do every single day than to praise and worship God himself. Our voice needs to become a voice of praise. Is your voice a voice of praise? Let me ask you secondly, is your voice a voice of prayer? Are you praying? Even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Whatever you're going to do, just come. We're ready. We're anticipating. We're eager for your arrival. Is your, is your voice a voice of prayer for those who don't know Jesus yet? To God, would you continue to be patient? Would you let this person that I love and care for come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ? Is your voice a voice of holiness, a voice of righteousness? Is your voice a voice of, of love? Ephesians chapter 5 tells us that we're to walk in the way of love. Jesus says, Jesus loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering. The picture of preparation is that we're preparing... And if we're preparing accurately for the, for the second coming of Jesus, we will be a voice calling out in the wilderness, a voice that says Jesus is the way and the truth and the life. So that's a picture of preparation that we're a voice. But I want you to see the price of preparation in this passage in Luke chapter 3. It's a quote from Isaiah's gospel. And the price of preparation is this, it's hard work. And there are four things I want you to look at. He says, every, every valley must be filled in, every mountain and hill brought low, every crooked, crooked way made straight, and every rough way made smooth. Let me talk to you about those, spiritually speaking, in a king who's physically coming to that country, all of those things had to happen. But I think there's a spiritual element to each one of these. And I would simply say this, the price of preparation is hard work. And it's this, every valley of defeat must be filled in. Valleys, you know, are those, are those depressions, those, those divisions, those, those, those down times in, in life. They reflect the defeat that the followers of Jesus feel like they live in. Defeats are... Uh, their numbers are thousands and thousands, but most of the time these, these defeats that we're living in lead us to this sense of depression. Some of them are inward. There's jealousy, there's bitterness, there's resentment, there's moodiness, there's fear, there's inferiority. And all those places where, where we're just feeling defeated that lead us to be discouraged and, and down, that needs to be filled in. Sometimes there are outward divisions, outward divisions especially that we've been talking about as a community of faith for the last many months is, is uh, not to do anything that breaks up the unity of the spirit that God uh, wants us to live as a unified, not just one church body, but the church as a whole. And that's why we're so excited about uh, the things that are going on in this community and how God's setting up those partnerships. But how do, how do I fill in these valleys of defeat? How do, how do I fill in? Because every valley of defeat in your life must be filled in. A couple of things. First of all, I want you to remember that you don't have to fight for victory. If you're a follower of Jesus, you fight from victory. 
that God, through Jesus, through his death and resurrection, has given you victory. That God, as he has poured out his Holy Spirit to live inside of you, to dwell inside of you, he's the one. That's why uh, Ephesians tells us that we need to keep on being filled with the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit who gives us uh, an awareness of the victory that's already ours. And so I just want to ask you, where are you feeling defeat in your life right now? If this Advent you want to live with perhaps today, the first thing you need to do to, as a voice of one crying in the wilderness is to no longer live in defeat, to fill in those valleys of defeat in your life with the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. Secondly, it says that every mountain and hill must be brought low. I would put it this way, that every mountain and hill of doubt in your life must be demolished. Where is it that you're doubting? Our verse for the decade, Psalm 37, 3, trust the Lord and do good. Trust the Lord. Where is God calling you to trust him? The mountains that you hold on to uh, of doubt and disbelief keep you from the blessings of God wants to have, wants to pour out on your life. The mountains of defeat, of, of, of doubt have to be leveled. Where are you doubting God right now? Are you doubting him for healing? Are you doubting him for a financial need? Are you doubting him for, uh, where, where are you doubting him? Are you doubting that he's even real? The scriptures say, without faith, it's impossible to please God. And so we've gone through the book of Genesis. We've seen over and over again, people that have chosen to live their life by faith. And that's the call of God on our life, to trust him, to trust him. My friends, I believe unbelief and doubt springs from pride. When I don't think God will do, or I don't think God can do. And sometimes I think I can do and I will do better. So I hold on to it myself. And so I would just ask you one more time, where, where are you finding defeat? Fill in that valley with the power of the Holy Spirit. Where are you finding doubt? Start living by faith. Start acting based on the belief that God loves you and cares for you and the confidence that he's going to do what he said he will do. Every valley of defeat must be filled in. Every mountain of doubt must be demolished. Then it says every crooked way made straight. And I would just put it this way. Every crooked way of dishonesty must be straightened. Every crooked way of dishonesty. Maybe there's dishonesty in all kinds of forms, a dishonesty of lying, a dishonesty of deception, a dishonesty of hypocrisy, a dishonesty of robbing God of uh, energy of misspent money and wasted time. Where, where are you just living in a way that's dishonest? Maybe uh, where are you living in a way that's not consistent with, with the way God would have you uh, live and you're just being dishonest about it. In the first place, you're usually dishonest about it was with yourself. We hear all the time as your pastors, oh, well, I'm, I'm just going to do this on my own. I'm just going to do this. Uh, I'm, I'm going to figure this out. And you're just being dishonest, my friends. The, the living life the Jesus way can't be done alone. And if you think you can do it on your own and you think you can figure it out on your own and you don't think you need help, my friends, you're just being dishonest and that, that crooked way of dishonesty must be straightened out. You need to surround yourself. That's why we're, we're pleading and encouraging all of you, especially as this year ends up and we look forward to the new year, get involved in a house church. If you're just, if you're just watching church on uh, a device and you're all by yourself, it's not as God would intend it. You need to get plugged in with, with other believers who help you live life the Jesus way. Where else are you being dishonest? Are you being dishonest about the way uh, you're giving your time and your resources, your money to God? And one of the things God got upset about in the Old Testament, he says, uh, you robbed me. And said, how did we rob you? He said, because you didn't bring what I asked you to bring, uh, the tithes into the storehouse. And we can get into a debate about tithing and all those kind of things, but God wants us to live lives of abundant generosity, which means uh, giving things away. It's why during this uh, time of, of, of Advent, we're encouraging you to do four things, to worship fully, to spend less, to give more of yourself intentionally and relation, relationally and to love all. But where is there just dishonesty in your life? I can't answer that question for you, but you can. Every, every valley of defeat must be filled in. Every mountain of doubt must be demolished. Every crooked way of dishonesty must be straightened out. And then it says the rough ways must be made smooth. And I put it this way, the rough ways of dislocation must be made smooth. What do I mean by dislocation? This is an interesting or this rough ways, it's, it talks about uh, uh, kind of like two different levels, like there's like there's a ground level and then there's a level of earth beneath it. The best way I could picture it for you is like, uh, they're just potholes in the middle of the road that make the road rough. 
one of the road, one of the roads that my wife and I travel on a, on a daily basis for this uh, for about six months this last year had a pothole in it and there was just most of the time no way to avoid it and you just hit that pothole and and man it's just does it dislocates all kinds of things inside you maybe in your vehicle but there's just this pothole and that's the picture that that there's some potholes that need to be filled in there's there's dislocation maybe you put it this way it's something that's out of place and I think a lot of times that that refers to us relationally and again no one else can answer this is there is there an area of your life that's dislocated is there an area of your life where there's just a pothole relationally and that that rough patch that rough hole needs to be smoothed out and filled in maybe it's with your spouse maybe there's a broken relationship there maybe it's with your children maybe it's with your parents Maybe it's with your extended family, and this time of year you're going to be getting around and you're like, I just need to make it through the day. No, you don't just need to make it through the day. Maybe does that rough relationship need to find healing? God is the one who restores and can bring families back together. Remember, we talked about the story of Joseph, and if Joseph can get to the place where he can say, hey, what you intended for evil, God meant for good, maybe, maybe we're the ones that can start that healing process. Every rough way of dislocation must be smooth. Is there, is there uh, some dislocation in your business relationships is there is there over the course of time has there become dislocation with your church family where you felt like I could just kind of separate and and some of those kind of things and nothing big maybe but it's just just some distances formed and there's just this dislocation my friend the only way to smooth out a rough place of dislocation it starts with repentance one of the questions that's asked in the book we've been going through on Tuesday nights until unity the author just starts a chapter with this have you ever considered to ask yourself this question, am I the problem? Am I the problem? And the reality of it is I might not be 100% of the problem, but usually in any place where there's dislocation in a relationship, I've got a burden to bear in that, and I need to come and I need to repent and I need to ask forgiveness, and I need to be to do what I can. The scriptures say, uh, as much as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. That's what it means to fill out those four things, that the, the picture a preparation is a voice calling in the wilderness. The work of preparation is that every valley of defeat must be filled in, every mountain of doubt must be demolished, every crooked way of dishonesty uh, must be straightened out, and every uh, a rough patch of dislocation must, must be smoothed over. And finally, at verse 6, I want you to look at the blessings of preparation. Look at this. It's beautiful. Verse 6 says, and all people will see God's salvation. Isn't that what we want? Isn't that the picture of of Advent, that God comes towards us so that we can see his salvation. And if we are voices of one calling in the wilderness and doing those four things, doing the hard work of preparation, and we see um, all people will see God's salvation, which we know means this, all people will see Jesus. All people will see Jesus. Look at three things it talks about about this blessing, the blessing of preparation. First of all, it's an unlimited blessing. It says all people. My friend, we need to understand and catch this worldwide vision that God came, that Jesus came for the nations. He didn't just come for me and my family. He didn't just come for uh, the church in America. Jesus came for the nations. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but come to everlasting life. It's bigger than our four walls. And when we look at this work of preparation, we need to understand how is God calling me to love and share Jesus in my home, in my heart, in my home, in my neighborhood, in my valley, and to the ends of the earth. My friends, it's a it's an unlimited blessing. Secondly, it's an unmistakable blessing. Look, it says, it says all people will see. It's not, they might see, but if we're doing the work of prep, if we're doing the hard work of preparation, the blessing is all people will see. When God starts to work, my friends, it's unmistakable. You can't miss it. We have to live lives that are changed. And thirdly, it's, a, it's an unspeakable blessing, God's salvation. Why in the world would God love us so much that he gave? Why in the world would Jesus willingly give up everything that was rightfully his and take on the form of a servant and being found in likeness of a human being, he became obedient unto death, even death on a cross. He was born to die so that you and I can live, and it's unspeakable. Thanks, 2 Corinthians 9, 15 says this, thanks be to God for his unspeakable gift. It's indescri it is indescribable, two glorious four words. And it's preparation. And if we're going to live with a perhaps today mentality, we need to be ready. So what, Tim? That's good. That was just John the Baptist. That, that's how he was supposed to live. He was the voice of one calling in the world. No, I think that's how we're supposed to live. Again, because there's not just a first advent. We believe that Jesus died and rose from the dead and he will return. Look at Second Peter chapter 3, verses 10 through 13 with me. And again, why does it matter? It's because we need to live with a perhaps today mentality. 
But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. Three things about the certainty of the second advent. You need to understand there's a certainty that the second advent is coming. The day of the Lord will come. There's an uncertainty of the timing of the second advent, uh, like a thief. But there's a third thing that needs to be involved. How then should we live? We should live like a voice of one crying in the wilderness. That's not exactly how Peter says it, but he says the same thing. He says, the heavens will disappear with a roar, the elements will be destroyed by fire, and the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. Verse 11, since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. The day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire and the elements that will melt in heat. But in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. We are looking forward to the second advent. Jesus will come again. We don't know when. And we need to live like perhaps today. And if we're living like perhaps today, we need to understand the picture that we're to be a voice of one crying in the wilderness. Prepare the way of the Lord. We need to do the hard work of preparation. We, we need to understand that it's, again, every valley of defeat has to be filled in. What valley of defeat do you need to fill in today through the power of the Holy Spirit? Every mountain of disbelief, uh, every mountain of doubt needs to be demolished. Where do you need to start living by faith? Uh, every crooked way of dishonesty, where are you being dishonest? It needs to be straightened out. And every, every rough way of dislocation, every broken relationship needs to be made smooth. That's what will point people to Jesus. And it's time. By the way, did you know that there's a global supply chain issue? I think there's a global spiritual supply chain issue as well. Have you seen those pictures of just those boats that are sitting out in the ocean filled with things waiting to get to the docks and they can't get to the docks because there aren't enough workers to unload them and there are not enough workers to truck them to wherever they need to be. Where, wherever the breakdown, and this isn't a political statement, please hear me say this. I just want you to see that. Have you seen those pictures of all those things just sitting out waiting to be distributed, but they can't get where they're going because there aren't enough workers? Does it remind you of the words of our Lord Jesus who said that he is the Lord of the harvest? And he said, look, my fields are ripe for harvest. Pray to the Lord of the harvest to send forth workers in his field. Workers in his field who prepare the way of the Lord. My friends, there is a spiritual global supply chain shortage of workers who are ready to go into the field. Because we want to make it all about us. And it's our responsibility. We, we, we can't take Jesus anywhere. But it's our responsibility to, to, to live lives that show and share the love of Jesus so that people are attracted to him. We need to be those kind of people this season of Advent. And if you will focus on the four things, you will look at how to worship fully, how to spend less, how to give more, and how to love all. I think the spiritual global supply chain issue will disappear if we will pray to the Lord of the harvest to send forth workers into his field so that there's no longer a shortage of those who are called to carry the message of Jesus and prepare for his second Advent because he's coming back and we don't know when, and we ought to live lives. My friends, perhaps today, Almighty God, forgive us for our role in this spiritual supply chain issue. When we ought to be workers in the field and we just sit back and we don't go and, 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 and tell, share and show the love of Jesus the way that we should, God, forgive us. We repent. And God, I pray for my life, for my family, for those that are listening, God, that today we would deal honestly and sincerely that every, every valley of defeat would be filled in. Every mountain of doubt would be demolished. Every crooked way of dishonesty uh, straightened out. And every rough way of dislocation, God, smoothed over because of the grace and power that's available to us because Jesus came. He lived a life of perfection. He died on a cross and he says that following him is the way to live. Father, we trust you. Father, now as we begin to talk about and work through what this means in our lives, in our homes, in our house churches, and in our community of faith, we want to be obedient. And so God, we just simply say, help us live like it could be perhaps today. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.